When the Buddha told the monks to go meditate, he used the verb jayati, which means to do jhana. But the same verb also means to burn. Pali has lots of verbs for burning. And this is the verb that means to burn with a steady flame. Ordinarily our minds burn like bonfires. The flames lick here and lick there and flame up and then die down, flame up again. If you were trying to read by a bonfire, it would be really hard, because the light's flickering too much. Which is why you have to change the way it burns. It's still burning, but it's burning in a way that you can read by. Jayati is the verb they use for an oil lamp. When you think about meditating, think about what's involved in starting a fire, getting it going, and putting it to use. Remember those three stages that John Fung talked about in the meditation. First you have to get the mind to settle down. Then once it's there, you have to learn how to maintain it, and then you have to put it to use. And there are three separate skills when you're getting it to settle down. You have to really protect it, because the fire is weak. Think about a person trying to start a fire on a windy day. You have a tiny little match. Of course, back in the time of the Buddha, they didn't have matches at all. They had fire sticks, which required even more work. You had to drill and drill and drill. You had this little hole, and they had the drill. And then you put a little piece of kindling, a few bits of sawdust. You put them inside, and then you just keep applying a lot of pressure. And if you let up to look at how things were going, the warmth would die down. So you had to keep keep at it, keep at it, keep at it. Once the little pieces of kindling caught, then you had to take them over to the fuel that you were trying to get to burn. You have to protect it. You have to cup your hands around it to protect it from the wind. And then very gradually add the fuel. If you add it too much all at once, you'd snuff out the fire. But if you worked at it properly, eventually it would catch. And then when it caught, You wouldn't have to put so much energy into it, but you still have to look after it, make sure that it didn't run out of fuel. And if a sudden gust came, you had to protect it again. Then there's the question of getting use out of it. I mean, having a fire sometimes, it's nice simply to have it nice and warm. But there are other things that need to be done. Food has to be cooked. Your house has to be heated. If you're working on a project that requires that something be melted or heated up, you'd need the fire for that. All this applies to meditating. When you're trying to get the mind to settle down, you have to be very, very attent on what you're doing. And just keep at it, keep at it, keep at it. You can't let yourself get discouraged. If you get discouraged, say, this is not working, you have to start over again. So any thoughts that come in at all, you have to protect it. And it's good to find a nice, quiet place so that the only wind that you're dealing with is the wind of your own mind. That's plenty right there. I have to keep all the defilements away, keep all your hindrances away. Until finally it catches. There's a sense that it really does feel good to be with the breath. It really does feel good just to sit here breathing in, breathing out. And you're able to create a sense of fullness. It 
making sure that you don't squeeze the breath out, don't force too much in, so the body feels balanced. There's no sense that you're trying to push the breath into a solid, say you're trying to think of the body as energy already. And as the breath comes in, it's simply more energies pooling into the energy you've already got. There's no clear line between the breath energy that was there already and the new breath coming in, but they mingle together. Think of it that way. And when it goes out, you don't have to squeeze it all out. Let it do the out-breath on its own. You learn how to read the point. Now it's the time to breathe in again. Keep at it. And a sense of fullness will develop, because you're not squeezing things as you're breathing out. All too often when we have that cartoon idea of the breath going out, that you have to squeeze everything to get it out. We start squeezing things that we don't need to squeeze at all, and that prevents any sense of fullness from developing or having a chance. So you try to develop that sense of fullness until the mind feels that its center of gravity has settled in. It's not constantly ready to run away. Once it's settled in, then you don't have to be quite so attentive to it. I mean, you have to tend to it, but you can actually allow other thoughts to come in. Not that you're going to go with them, but you're beginning to see the process of how a thought forms. There's room for that. At the same time, as you try to maintain it, you find that you can actually get into deeper states. John Fuhn gives the analogy of setting something in concrete. First you make the forms, then you pour the concrete in. And as long as the concrete hasn't set, you can't take the forms away. But as soon as it's set, you can take them away. No problem. The concrete won't spill out because now it's solid. In the same way with the director thought and the evaluation. It's in the beginning. Your mind is tempted to think about and evaluate things outside, so you just turn your thinking to the breath and keep it there. And if you stop thinking about the breath, the mind will start going back to the, its old preoccupations. But once things have settled in and there's a sense of really belonging here, you can drop the direct of thought and evaluation and instead of going back to your ordinary state, you can go into a deeper state of concentration where you're just there. The breath is one with the body, the mind is one with the breath. And you don't have to do a lot of thinking to, to protect it. The sense of well-being is enough to keep you glued here. And so on in through the different stages of concentration. And as you protect them, you find the, the big issue is going to be boredom. Nothing's happening. Everything's very still. It feels good. But it's this strange tendency of the mind. Once you've given it something that's really pleasant like this, it's decided, well, I want something else. This is where you have to deal with the thoughts that would pull you away and say, okay, enough of this. You say, no, not enough. I really want to master this skill. I want to see how deep it can go. As for the thoughts that are bored, you have to question them. Are you really bored, or is there something going to come up in the meditation that you're afraid to see? Because that can happen too sometimes. The mind has its subterfuges. So you have to watch out for them. And it's here you really get to know your mind really well, the different arguments that it will bring for thinking about something else, saying, enough of this, and you say, no, not enough, I'm going to stay here. Because the longer you stay, the more you're going to see. And simply in getting the mind to stay here, you are getting some benefit from the concentration already. That's one of the uses, the sense of well-being, and also an opportunity to observe your defilements. And it gets simply deeper into the defilements. See 
or more clearly, where their allure is. Why there's that part of the mind that, even though you've got a state of concentration going, would like to do something else. Why? And things you've thought through many, many times is going to go back again. Why? What else is there? What, what is it that you haven't seen yet? This is when you put the concentration to use. Getting the mind still enough so that it can see things clearly. And with enough of a sense of well-being so that if something comes up that it's ordinarily embarrassed to admit to itself, it's feeling a little bit more good-natured, a little bit less threatened. And it's willing to admit, oh yeah, I do go for that. So this is what a John Lee would call the cool fire of jhana. As he says, unlike the hot fires of your greed, aversion, and delusion, or passion, aversion, and delusion, it doesn't wear out your nerves. It's actually good for the body, good for the mind. And it brings light into areas of the mind that have long been dark. You can read your mind because the flame is steady. Now it's still burning, and this is where the image of Nibbana comes in. That's where there's no fire, no burning at all, even the, the cool fire of jhana. But it's through the cool fire that you get to the place where the fire goes out. So learn how to light this fire, tend to it, and put it to use. Because its benefits are more than many. <laughs>